Good morning. Good morning. So we are still working our way through the essentials. We've covered the inerrancy of Scripture, of God's divinely inspired word. We've covered monotheism, there is one God. We've covered the Trinity, there is one God, co-equal, co-eternal, in three distinct parts. We've covered the second part, or we're covering in the process of covering the second part of the Trinity, Jesus, the Son, who is at one and the same time the Son of God and God. Uh, a couple weeks ago we dealt with the virgin birth and why we believe that to be an essential. Um, today we're going to do kind of an intro to the next portion. Uh, I'm going to kind of give you an outline over what I want to talk about over the next week or so. Um, we're going to talk about the cross and the empty tomb. See, we dealt with Christmas a couple weeks ago. Now we're dealing with Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. And so, Happy <coughs> Resurrection Sunday. You can say that back. Happy Thank you. <laughs> so, why are these essential? Well, we're going to we're going to look at this. We're going to take this apart. Today, like I said, I'm just giving you an overview because we really need to get in depth to understand what all was taking place. Why the cross? Why the empty tomb? Because you can't have one without the other. Okay? Scripture makes it very clear. Okay? And we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. But why the cross? Why the cross? Why, why do we have to have a Savior? Very simple. We're stupid. Okay? If you don't think you're stupid, get over yourself right now. Because you and me, us, individually, collectively, stupidly choose to do things our own way, contrary to what God has told us. Adam and Eve could have been Glenn and Christy very easily. Matter of fact, if at the beginning of time, God had created Glenn instead of Adam, you'd be in the same place now, but there'd probably be a pastor up here named Adam <laughs> instead of Glenn. Okay? Because I would have made the same mistake, and you're arrogant and foolish if you think you wouldn't have. Now, I'm not saying that to belittle you. I'm saying that because God knew from before he created anything what was going to happen in the garden. When was Jesus slain? Before the foundation of the world. So see, it doesn't matter if it was Adam, or Glenn, or Kevin, or Christopher, or Tim, it, it didn't matter. Jesus had already been set on a course, had already determined what was going to take place at Calvary. Okay? So, if you have the idea that you've got it together, we're fooling ourselves. Alright? The only way we ever get anything together is by giving it all over to Him and letting Him put it together. Okay? Who of you has anything other than what you received. Can any of you say, oh, I got that on my own. Well, no, Scripture says you can't say that because God gave you everything. Oh, man, I got, so, yeah, I worked really hard those 40 years for this retirement. I think that's mine. Who gave you the ability to work? Who gives a man eyes? Who makes him blind? Who makes him deaf? Okay? Without God, none of it would be possible. Keep in mind, let's just go back to the very basics. If God chooses not to speak, it all comes apart. It's by His Word that everything is held together. Okay? So, let's get a right mindset when we go into this. Because we tend to treat sin frivolously. Okay? We... we don't like to deal with the nature of sin. We like to kind of brush that under the rug and move on to the good things. But you can't get to the good things if you're still carrying sin around with you. All right? So, original sin. They ate the fruit. I don't know what kind of fruit they ate. The Bible doesn't tell us. They just tell us that it was 
comely to look at. And it was good for eating. A banana? I don't look at a banana and go, wow, that looks good for eating. But who knows what he was thinking. An apple? We always assume it was an apple. I don't know where we got an apple. You know? Was it a golden delicious? I don't know. It doesn't matter. I don't think it was any fruit that we've got. I really don't. I think it was unique to that tree. Okay? It was the knowledge fruit. Okay? So, Eve, being deceived by the serpent, eats of the fruit, and then gives the fruit to her husband, who also, being stupid, eats of the fruit. Okay? Now, we see the nature of sin from there on. We see that God comes into the garden in the cool of the evening, and he calls them, and he calls Adam, where are you? Now, God knew where Adam was. I told you a couple weeks ago. Can you imagine trying to play hide and seek with God? How lame would that be? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Uh, Kevin's there, Christopher's there, and we got Robin over here. All the oxen free, I win. That would be lame. And then when it was your turn to go find him? Good luck. Okay? So why, why was he calling Adam? Was it for his sake? No, it wasn't for his sake. It was for Adam's sake. And, and to be honest with you, from that time to this, God has walked calling. He has walked calling. And he calls, Glenn, where are you? Dustin, where are you? Christian, where are you? Not for his sake. He knows where we are, but for ours. So we will realize that we're lost. Okay? So then, Adam comes out wearing a twig. Adam, what? what, what, what? Really? All this and that's what you got? Come on. God, I, the woman. The woman. The woman you gave me. It was all her fault. Really, do you see what he's saying there? Do you really see what he's saying there? He's not really blaming the woman, is he? That's right. He's blaming God. If you had not given me this, I was happy with the monkey. The monkey never gave me fruit to eat. And he goes, you just threw me under the bus. It was, it was the snake. It was the snake. Okay, so we know the story, right? And God calls down a curse. Now, personally, I don't think God cursed them. I think God spoke forth the curse that was already on them. Okay? Because remember what he said. When you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. So the curse was already in place. I think God was speaking for something that had happened when they willed in their heart and purposed in their mouth to eat that fruit. Okay? So, he speaks first to the snake. And he says, bad things, you slither in the dust. There will be enmity between you and you. Now, right there we have a promise. Okay? Flip open to Genesis chapter 3. I want you to catch this. This is important. <clears throat> we talked about this a couple weeks ago when we talked about the virgin birth. Okay? The Lord God, I'm in uh, chapter 3, verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, there's a couple things that you need to catch here. One, there's enmity between us and snakes. So any of you that like snakes, 
No, that's not my point. That's not, <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. Okay. There is enmity. Who, who is the snake here? Who is the serpent? Satan. Satan. Remember he calls him the, the wily serpent from old? Okay. So we understand that God's not talking about a garter snake or a blue racer or even you know, any of the boa constrictor. Or, you know, that, that's not what he's talking about. He is speaking prophetically about Satan. Now, it's kind of weird to say God is speaking prophetically because how do you speak prophetically when you already know everything? But God is speaking on our behalf prophetically. And he's saying that there is going to be enmity between Satan and man. We are at war. Okay? And it's kind of a weird dichotomy that those that reject God think, you really think Satan's your friend? You really think that what the world has to offer is friendship? Right here, God says, no. He hates you. Enmity. Enemy. He despises you. So you get to choose whom you will serve. Are you going to serve God who loves you? Loves you with an undying love? Who loves you so much that he willingly gave up his life for you? Or are you going to serve Satan who hates you? And his only goal is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's your two choices. That's it. I'm going to serve myself. Satan. No, oh, no, 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 no. I don't worship the devil. Who are you worshiping? Because you're not worshiping God. If you're not worshiping God, anything other than God is Satan. Uh, 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 the, the, the scripture makes it clear. There's no other alternative. Okay? So first, there's war. But then, here's the part that is cool, because he nestled away right in the middle of this curse is a promise. And he says, there will be enmity between you and the woman, and between her offspring and your offspring. Now, this is the only time that we have offspring, or in some translations it reads seed. This is the only time in all of Scripture that we see it referred to specifically the woman. It's the only time. That means we need to kind of pay attention, because it's important. So, and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, quite honestly, would you rather have somebody kick you in the heel or kick you in the head? Well, I'd rather they kick me in the heel. I think God is establishing a precedent here. Okay? Yeah, Satan is going to do something against man. I think specifically he's speaking about Jesus. I think God is looking down to Calvary where Satan thinks he is going to win a great victory by taking the very Son of God and putting him on a cross. And Satan's going to dance for joy thinking, woo I did it! I did it! Alright? He's going to bruise your heel. But, three days later, what do we find out? Satan done got kicked in the head. Because Jesus went and he took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. Now, we're not going to get into a really theological thing right here. Satan didn't have those. Okay, That has always been the premise of God alone. Okay, You read through scripture. God determines when a man will live, when a man will die. It says in Psalms that before I was born, every day of my life was written in your book. Okay. God is not subject to Satan in anything. That's a false doctrine that came out. It's a lie. Satan cannot do anything apart from God's will. Understand that. Because when you wrap your mind around that, you understand that God's will is a whole lot bigger than you can imagine. And you understand sometimes that God lets things happen that we just can't fathom because his purposes are far beyond ours. Okay? Far beyond ours. So we see right here 
the bruising of the head and the bruising of the heel, we see enmity. We see the prophecy of the virgin birth. Now, was God surprised when he came into the garden? No. Nothing surprises God. you got to keep in mind, God knows everything all the time. And he always knew everything all the time. Because God exists outside of time. Here's, here's something that's going to boggle your brain. You guys remember Hezekiah? Lying in bed. And the prophet comes to him and says, this disease is unto death. And what happens? Hezekiah rolls over and he faces the wall. And he says, God, I'm asking that you would extend my life. And the prophet's outside, man. He's headed home. You did my job. Gonna go home, eat the matzo. <laughs> and, and God says, whoop, whoop, whoop. <clears throat> go back and tell him, I'm gonna extend his life for 15 years. Right? Now, let me ask you something. Did God change his mind? Did God, in that moment in time, go, oh, oh, you know what, Hezekiah, you got a good point. Let's rewrite the book. No. Because, see, God already knew. And what's really gonna boggle your brain is that in that moment, God was also existing at the moment that he wrote all of Hezekiah's life. Now, that don't trip your mind. I don't know what will. Because he exists always at all the same time, knowing everything. And so he knew way back that Hezekiah was going to come to this point and this was going to have to change. Why? For God's sake? No. I think for ours. I think for ours. I think to show us that there is power in prayer. Not for our sake, for his sake. Look, look, we got to get over this idea that anything is for our sake. God already knows what's best for us. God's already put into place what is best for us. Okay? So when you start praying, your will be done, you, you realize oftentimes you're praying not God's best for you? Do you understand that? Because what does the scripture say? I know the plans I have for you. Right? The plans that I have for you. Evil plans? Bad plans? Horrible things? No. What does he say? For good. Good plans. You, you, you think somehow you're going to impress God with a better plan? God, I know this is really what you want me to do, but... I think this would be much better. Well, that's what you get for thinking. <laughs> Quit it. <laughs> okay? I'm kind of getting off here a little bit. Let's, get, let's refocus. What's up with the cross? Deuteronomy 21. Don't turn there. I'm just going to read this for you. It says, And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, he is to be put to death. And if you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree. But you shall bury him the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. <clears throat> now, God does stuff that I don't get sometimes. I don't, I don't get it. I figure if a man deserves death, and you start heaving rocks at his head, and he dies, it's done. And if a man deserves death, and you run him through with a sword, he dies, and it's done. And if a man does something deserving of death, and he's hung on a tree, he dies, and it's done. But God doesn't see it that way. God looks at this and says, look, anyone that's hung on a tree is cursed. Okay. All right. I don't know why God chose that. He didn't, he didn't tell me. He, didn't, he doesn't even really go into, in, in all of Scripture, he doesn't explain why. Why is that person cursed and, and not the one that got rocks heaved at his head? But do you notice what happens? Let's jump ahead to the New Testament. The Jews are looking for a reason to kill Jesus. And they run up a bunch of charges. They run him into Pilate. And Pilate's going, you want to kill him for what? Because he said, what? Really? I, I don't see any problem with this. Let him go. No, wait, what? You, you don't want to let him go? So, so he brings him out and, and he says, all right, you know what? Here, 
being very political, being astute politically. He says, look, look, I'm going to give you a choice. We got Jesus. Well, I, I can't see what he did wrong. I don't understand what your problem is with him. And we got Barabbas, who's a jerk. He's a murderer. He's filth. He's scum. Whom shall I release to you today? Let me give you a hint. Not him. And the Jews say, release to us Barabbas. But then, then they go further. And he says, what then shall I do with Jesus? Now what did the Jews say? They call out at the instigation of the Sanhedrin, of the religious leaders, they call out now, we look at that and we don't understand the significance of that until we understand that the debt that they are calling for is cursing him. Okay? They could, have, they could have stoned him. According to their law, they should have stoned him. They could have shot him with arrows. They could have drowned him. They could have, they could have done any number of things and satisfied the requirement of the law for what they felt was the offense for their trumped up charges. But that's not what they said. What did they say? Crucify him. <clears throat> Hang him on a tree so that he would be cursed. Why do you think they did that? Do you think that was on accident? No. Do you know why I think they did that? I think they felt like they were being righteous because this man had multiple times set himself equal to God. Before Abraham was, I am. Okay? We need to start understanding some of these things because a lot of times we read through Scripture and, and it's like you're, you're watching one movie and all of a sudden right in the middle of it you get switched to another movie because here's Jesus having a dialogue with the religious leaders and all of a sudden everybody's picking up rocks. <laughs> like what, what happened? We need to read with understanding. Okay? I think... They wanted him crucified because he had so insulted their belief and their faith that they wanted him cursed. It wasn't sufficient for them to curse him. Because they did that too, remember? When, when they, they made the accusation and, you know, tear down the temple and I will rebuild it in three days and they, they, they spit on him and they punched him and they cursed him, but that wasn't sufficient. They didn't want just the curse on him. They wanted his body cursed. Okay? <clears throat> so, why the cross? I'm just going to throw this in here for you. I'm just going to trip you up a little bit. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. See, at the center of the Christian faith will always be the cross. And people who do not have this faith, people who do not have God's Spirit living inside of them, don't understand it. They don't get it. And I'm afraid, unfortunately, a lot of us don't get it. To us, it's become a problem. This, this, we look at this and, and we think it's a nice piece of jewelry. You know? We, we wear it around our neck or maybe we put it on our ring or, or we get a nice brooch. Brooch? Brooch? brooch. We, we put a pendant. <laughs> I don't know what you call that. I don't wear them, so I don't really know. And, and that's, that's kind of the extent of what we think about it. I want to read something to you. You've probably heard this before. This was written by Gerald H. Bradley. He was a physician who went back into Scripture and he studied what the cross was. And he went back and he looked historically and came to a determination this is his medical opinion about what happened on the cross. Okay. This was the most agonizing death a man could face. He had to support himself in order to breathe. Now keep in mind, Jesus was suspended by a nail through his feet and nails through his hands. Now, 
Uh, I know some people get caught up in, okay, well, was it through the hand or was it through the wrist? The Greek word for hand means from the fingertip to the forearm. So it could have been anywhere in there. Scripture doesn't tell us specifically where it was. Medically, we understand that it's improbable it was through his hand because the, the tendons and the bones in the hand wouldn't support the weight. But it doesn't say that they didn't tie his arms to support the weight. We don't know. Okay? So don't get hung up on that. Okay? But he had nails in his hands and his feet, and that was all that he had to support his weight. Okay? The flaming pain caused by the spikes hitting the median nerve in the wrist explode up his arms and into his brain and down his spine. The spike burning through the nerve between the metatarsal bones of his feet jerk his body erect. Then the leg muscles convert, convulse and drive his body downward, beating him against the cross. So you get the impression jerking up to get air and then dropping back down from exhaustion. Okay? Air is sucked in but cannot be exhaled until the buildup of carbon dioxide in the lungs and bloodstream stimulates breathing to relieve the cramps. Exhaustion, shock, dehydration, and paralysis destroy the victim. The heart is barely able to pump the thick blood as each of his billions of cells die one at a time. Prior to his death and all his agony, Jesus is in full control of his mind. He asks the Heavenly Father to forgive them for they know not what they do. Finally, in death, the blood coagulates and separates into serum and clotted blood cells. See, the cross was not the most expedient way to kill. It was the most horrific. It's what you use to make a statement. Because you could line them up and just walk down and stick a dagger into the heart one by one by one and go, go home and eat you know, coffee and donuts. Day's work is done. But the cross was to make a statement. And we see this. We actually see uh, Nero lining uh, roadways with, with Christians on crosses. And we see this uh, after the fall of several of the, the cities in Jerusalem, or in Israel, around the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, we see that the, the Romans were making a statement so they would crucify those who were left, those who had the gall to resist them. This was a statement. This is like when one of your child does something that is really bad, you make sure that all the others understand they don't want to do that. And you pull out the stick. Okay? They're making a statement. Now, God had already established that cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. God established also that this would be the form of execution that the Romans would use to make a statement. Now, God also determined that these two things should meet to end the life of his son. Okay? So, Romans 3.23 says what? Come on, say it out. Oh, <laughs> Josh, would you quote 323, please? For the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay. 323 is before that, though. For all the sin, all short of the glory of God. <laughs> 623 is what was coming next. Okay? So, understand this. From Adam to the newest born babe right now is included in this statement. For all have sinned. Okay? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone. There is no one righteous. When God makes emphatic, all-inclusive statements, there's not excuse. Okay? When he says all have sinned, that means everyone. When he said no one is righteous, that means no one. Okay? What is the result of that? For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Now, if we are caught in sin, if there is no way for us to get out of sin, what is the result of that condition? Death. death. Now, is that death just fall over and it's done? No. That's, that's the physical death, 
But that just leads us to the eternal death. What is the eternal death? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I get, I kind of chuckle at people that, that go, oh, you know, you really think God would torture people in hell forever and burning fires and flames? And, uh, nah, nah, nah. Look, that's not what's going to make hell so bad. That's, that's, that's the least of it. Do you, you understand what's going to happen at the end of all things? God is going to have every single person stand before him and give account. And they're going to come into the very presence of God, oftentimes a God they deny. And they're going to see him in his radiant glory and know him for who he is because it says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So all of them are going to come in with full understanding and go, oops. And to the sheep, he will say, enter into eternal life. But to the goats, he will say, depart from me. Listen, what is going to make hell so bad isn't the fire. What's going to make hell so bad is that you will have known the presence of the ever-living God and be cast out forever. Okay? That's what hell is. To be eternally separated. Now look, in this life, we have people walking all around and go, oh, I don't accept God, I don't reject God, I reject Him. But God is still here. I can go right here. Excuse me, Ron. Here you go. Ron doesn't exist! I refuse to accept that Ron exists. He is not here. Tim, where's Ron? No, he's not. <laughs> Can you prove that he's there? Uh, no, I refuse. <laughs> that could be a mirage. That could be a holographic display from Star Trek. I don't know. Look, that's what atheists do all the time. God says he's revealed himself in creation. He's revealed himself in man's conscience. And they go, no, I refuse to look. I refuse to accept it. Okay? So, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. How do we get out? We are without hope. How do we get out? Well, we, we just we own a lot of livestock and kill them. Raise them and kill them. Raise them and kill them. Raise them and kill them. And then they've got to do weird stuff and eat it. <laughs> Romans 5, 12 through 19. Go ahead and turn there. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. You, you see the inclusive statement there? Death, sin came in through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. The death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who is to come. Okay? So we see the condition, right? Sin has come in. Sin brings death. Sin is spread to all people. Therefore, death is spread to all people. Okay? You, you got that? Okay? You have to understand this. You have to believe this. Because if you don't really believe this, the cross is foolishness. Okay? But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, 
abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. Look, one trespass brought condemnation. We have committed more than one trespass. We have committed many trespasses. I in my life have committed many trespasses. I have not committed all the trespasses you have committed. We as a people have committed uncounted trespasses. But the gift, the free gift, covers all of those and brings justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Now, Paul gets wordy for me. So sometimes i got to go back and i gotta, I got to simplify. So bear with me. This is simplified glench. Adam messed it up for everyone. Jesus made it right. Okay? That's, that's what all this is saying. Adam blew it. We followed in the footsteps of Adam and we blew it even bigger than Adam because we didn't just do the one. We, we, did, we, we invented sins. We created new ones. We were not content with the old sins that our fathers committed, so we invented new ones. But Jesus fixed it. Why the cross? I think it's an elegant picture. Because if anyone that is hung on a tree is cursed of God, but man is already cursed of God because of our own sin, our willfulness, our own desire to separate ourselves from God. We're already cursed. Now don't... Look, look at the picture here. There's only one been born who was born perfect, free from sin. Okay? Only one. Well, what about Adam? He wasn't born. He was made up out of the dust and God breathed life into him. So he wasn't born. There's only one been born who was perfect and free from sin. Okay? Jesus Christ, the virgin birth. That's why the virgin birth is so important. Okay? That's why it's necessary to believe this. Because if, it's, if you don't believe in the virgin birth, then he was under the same condemnation as we were. Alright? So, one was born without sin. One lived a life sinlessly. Suffering every temptation that we suffer, and yet did not sin. Okay? And went to the cross, not cursed of God. The entirety of his life, he was free of that curse. The curse of the law of sin and death. Okay? So he was perfect. And yet, on our behalf, he comes to the cross willingly, willingly. Now don't get me wrong. When, when God formed Jesus into the man God, the incarnation, he didn't put some kind of perverse nature in him that was just like, I can't wait to die. Oh, man, uh, the whippings. I just, I can't wait for the whippings. Uh, we know that's not the case. Because in the garden, he was so distressed that he sweat blood. And he poured out his heart saying, God, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. If there's another way, Father, let's do it. But, not as I will. Not according to my desire, but as you will. Now listen, we can pour our hearts out to God and ask Him whatsoever we will, but we have to understand that it's His will that we should be seeking. Right? His will. Why? Because He knows. So He goes to the cross. Well, He's innocent of the charges that they bring against Him. And what's sad is, even the heathens see this. Pilate saw it. I wonder about Pilate. Man, what a horrible place to be. What a horrible place to be. The best he can do is, I wash my hands of this. 
I am not guilty of this man's blood. And the people that knew better, the people that should have known, that had the writings of the law and the prophets, that had God's choosing upon them, the ones that should have known, rejected it. The, the stone that the builders rejected would become the chief cornerstone, the capstone. But it's also a stone that makes people stumble. Okay. So he goes to the cross, completely innocent. What happens on the cross? He becomes cursed. He is cursed. He's cursed. Do you understand that? And by receiving in himself that curse, completely innocent, he takes the curse from me. He takes it from me, and he bears it himself on the cross. Okay? Now, what's required of me? How, how do I get this? What do I have to do so that the curse is removed from me and put up there? All i got to do is believe. All i got to do is believe. And, and you know what? Even that's not very difficult because God gives me what I need to believe. So basically, all i got to do is agree with what God is already telling me. Uh, that's it. Because it, it can't be dependent on me. If it was dependent on me, we wouldn't need the cross. It can't be dependent on you because if it was dependent on you, we wouldn't need the cross. Right? So all, I, all that's responsible for me, all that I have to do is say, God, I agree. That's confession. I agree. I am lost. I am cursed. I am deserving of your utter rejection. Why is the empty tomb so important? Why? Why is the cross, why, is, why doesn't it just end there? Why is the empty tomb so important? Romans chapter 10, verse 9. <clears throat> says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, confess, that, that just means you're agreeing. Okay? So if you agree with your mouth, you speak out, Jesus is Lord, you're not making something up, you're not making a false statement, you're not even making an original statement, you're simply acknowledging what is. Okay? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Now look, I don't know how much more importance God can put on the empty tomb than this. You have to be convinced that God reached down from heaven and breathed life back into his son. And that Jesus was resurrected that that was the, the exclamation point that makes the cross so important. It is finished. I have done it. It is accomplished. Okay? First Corinthians 15. This, I'm going to close with this. incredible understanding. He has incredible insight into why the empty tomb is so important. Okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. 
And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. You see? As much value and importance as we place on the cross, and, and, and rightfully so, we have to, God has placed an equal value on the empty tomb. See, our hope isn't just in the forgiveness of our sins. Because if we go to the, the grave and that's it, then what matter the forgiveness of sins? If there's no afterlife, what matter forgiveness of sins? But if there is a resurrection from the dead, as promised, then we have an eternity where all of a sudden forgiveness of sins is very, very important. Because it will determine whether or not we spend that eternity with God or without God. So God has established in His Word that the necessity of the cross is that the curse will be removed from me, from you, from any who would believe. But he doesn't, he doesn't leave it there. There's the empty tomb as well. The promise. There is a resurrection. That when we go into the grave, should we go to the grave before he returns, there is a resurrection unto a new life. An eternal life. Just like I read that passage this morning, where there will be no more tears, no more mourning, no more pain, Death. That our hope will be fulfilled. Not a, not a hope in vain, a hope based on the promises that God has given. And the word tells us that He is faithful to fulfill His promises. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, next week we're going to get a little bit more in depth. God willing, we're going to get a little bit more in depth to why. The shedding of blood was necessary. How uh, the sin, that, that, that whole thing worked. Uh, don't, don't, don't panic. I'm not going to get real into law. I won't even bring any Latin into it. Okay? Because I stink at Latin. So, um, but it's important for us to understand people. We have to know what is essential to our faith. We have to know and be convinced that it is essential. Because like Paul says, otherwise we're a people without hope. Okay. Father, we bless you today and we thank you. We honor you for your word. Father, we honor you for your truth. God, that your spirit reveals all truth to us. And I ask, Lord God, that our eyes and our hearts would be open to the fullness of your truth. I ask, Lord God, that you would settle in our hearts what you have done, the efficacy of what you have done, that it is sufficient. Nothing can be added to it to make it any better. And nothing can be taken away from it. It is finished. It is accomplished. We lift this day to you, Father, and we ask that you would set in our hearts and our minds a desire and a zeal to serve you, to be a useful tool to your hand. Father, a servant with whom you would be well pleased. We thank you and we honor you in Jesus' name.